very much for your patience. We're going to get underway here. I'd like to welcome you to Civic Camp Citizens uh, Ward 7 Councilor Forum. Thank you very much for attending tonight and for showing an interest in the issues that shape our city. My name is Joey Oberhofner. I'm a writer for CalgaryPolitics.com and I will be your moderator this evening. For those who are not familiar with Civic Camp, Civic Camp is a nonpartisan public advocacy group enabling citizens to engage in creating a city that works for us all. Any Calgarian is welcome to become a Civic Camper by visiting civiccamp.org and listening more about the organization, what values Civic Campers have set out for themselves, and joining up with a group that interests them. One of those groups is the Election Initiatives Group. This group decided one of the best ways they could raise public awareness and civic issues during the campaign was to ensure a forum is held in each ward, something that in 2010 we became the first group in Calgary to do. We have some thanks before we get underway. Thank you first to the Civic Camp volunteers who have donated their time to make tonight's event a reality. We could not have done it without a few sponsors who generously donated their time and services as well. Firstly, thanks to our hosts this evening, Eau Claire Market, for the donation of their venue. I want to thank the Calgary Sound Rentals and the Calgary Roadrunners for providing equipment for tonight's forum at a significantly reduced rate. I'd also like to thank our media partners, CBC Calgary, CJSW, Fast Forward Weekly, and Metro Calgary for helping to get the word out about these important forums. Thank you to LivestreamCalgary.com, who will be live streaming tonight's proceedings on the internet. Uh, I hear they have that on computers now. Uh, thank you to the Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils and the Alberta Teachers Association for their support with the School Board Trustee Citizens Forums. A big thank you to the Students Association of Mount Royal University, our Ward 11 Citizens Forum partner, the University of Calgary Students Union, who are our Ward 1 and Mayoral Citizens Forum partner, and the Calgary Foundation for helping us pay the few bills that we did acquire. Finally, a big thanks to our candidates and all of you for coming today. All right, everybody's favorite part of the evening, the format and ground rules. Very exciting. Civic campers have named these forums citizens' forums because the questions for the first two-thirds of tonight's forum have been sourced from Calgarians at large. Civic Camp asked Calgarians what questions they would like to be asked at these forums. Over 65 questions were submitted by dozens of Calgarians online. Almost 1,000 votes were cast for which questions Calgarians thought were most important. The top vote-getting questions are what we will be asking this evening. Here's how the format will work. Each candidate will be asked a minimum of eight questions and will be provided two minutes to respond to most of them. The order in which the candidates will be asked to respond to each question will be drawn randomly before the question is asked. I will draw two candidates to answer each question. Once both candidates have answered the question, I will ask if anyone would like to expand on their answer or to speak to the issue if they were not one of the initial respondents. At that time, any candidate can cash in one of the chips they have been given in front of them there by depositing it into the glass in front of them. I'll call on them to, in order to answer, and they will then be given one minute to offer their answer or to elaborate on the answer they already gave. To ensure we ask some more ward-specific questions as well, everyone in the audience has been provided cards or the opportunity to fill out cards behind us here, behind the sound booth, right where the gentleman in orange is standing. That's Peter. Everybody say, hi, Peter. <laughs> so if you have a question specific to Ward 7 uh, that you would like asked this evening, please go see Peter, write down your question on that card, and uh, during the intermission... Write it down, pop it in the box, yeah. and, uh, and then uh, we will go through those questions and pick four to ask in the second half of this evening's um, uh, presentation. Working with me tonight uh, for, from Civic Camp are Jeremy, our logistics person, as well as Peter, who everybody already said hi to, and Jim, who will be handling the timer this evening. On that note, I'd like to remind candidates uh, and everybody watching of the rules of etiquette for uh, this forum. Firstly, respect the clock. We do have a timer to help you keep track of the time. Please deliver your statements and responses in the time provided. Secondly, make it easy for the audience to listen. Don't interrupt other candidates when they speak. Thirdly, stay issues focused. This is a forum, not a debate. We want to hear your ideas as candidates. Please avoid personal references or criticism directed at your fellow candidates. And lastly, let the audience decide. We ask supporters to leave their signs at the back of the room where they have uh, booths for each candidate. Uh, where, and campaigning is encouraged back there. But here we want to hear the ideas from each of our four candidates. Applause is okay, but any other interruptions from campaigners on the floor will not be allowed. 
In the event there is an interruption from the floor, I will ask the timer to stop the clock. The interruption will be dealt with, which may include asking the person making the interruption to leave, and then the person who was speaking will have a chance to, to finish off their answer. I'd like to introduce our candidates by allowing them two minutes to tell you a little bit about themselves. We'll do this starting from your left. First up, please welcome Mr. Kevin Taylor, who has two minutes. Thank you, Joey. Good evening and welcome. I wish to thank everyone for being engaged in their ward, coming here tonight, the volunteers with Civic Camp, and everyone else who helped out in setting this up tonight. Thank you. I'm running for Ward 7 Councillor because I believe our communities deserve more representation, equal representation, someone who is responsive and responds to the issues throughout the whole ward. I encourage you to resist voting on name recognition, but vote for someone who's going to be a guardian of your tax dollars, your hard-earned tax dollars. Thank you. Who will provide leadership on council and in the community. I'm a results-driven small business owner. I own the Cheesecake Cafe on McLeod Trail. I've owned it for the last nine years. I employ 71 employees. They rely on me to make the right decision every day to keep them employed. I would like to bring that mentality to City Hall to represent you. On Monday, October 21st, vote Kevin Taylor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Our next candidate to speak will be the incumbent councillor, Drew Farrell. Uh, councillor Farrell, you have two minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. I'd like to thank Civic Camp for holding these forums and all of you for attending. These forums are so very important, and so is this election. One of the issues that's front and center to the residents of Ward 7 is taxes. But when we talk about taxes, what are we really talking about? Our taxes are directly related to sprawl. Each new house built in the suburbs costs taxpayers $4,500, and we've added 400,000 Calgarians since 1995. Growth through sprawl is unsustainable. We need to be smarter about how Calgary grows. I believe in smart growth, and I know that the residents of Ward 7 do too. We need developers to pay their share, fair share, and I am fighting for that. We need to invest in our in existing infrastructure and maximize the use of our schools, our transit, transit, our fire halls, before we want, rush out to build new ones. We need smart growth. We are at a crossroads of two very different visions. If we don't take this opportunity today, our children and our grandchildren will pay the cost. Together, we have created a great vision for our city, and our neighborhoods are better for it. This is an exciting time for Calgary, and we still have a lot of work to do, and I would be honored if we could do it together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Farrell. The next uh, candidate to speak will be Mr. Brent Alexander. Mr. Alexander, you have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to Super Camp for doing this tonight. And good evening, I am Brent Alexander. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to engage with you and find out what is important to you. My vision for Ward 7 is an inclusive and diverse community, engaged in making each neighborhood even more vibrant than it already is by preserving the things that make each one unique and adding to each that may be missing and beneficial to the neighborhood. This can only happen by fully engaging the neighborhood on projects and developments that impact them. Whether it is a redevelopment of a local shopping center into a town center, or reshaping a major traffic artery through their neighborhood, people desperately want to be engaged to see the changes that will benefit their neighborhood, their neighborhood and keep Calgary vibrant. I hope the background in community, I have the background in community involvement, work experience, and education to help move each community forward in its own unique path that will increase the diversity and vibrancy of Calgary, taking it from good to great. This can only start by leveling the tax structure to be fair to all Ward 7 communities, ending the subsidy of suburban and inner city developments alike, and repatriating those funds to deal with our aging infrastructure, such as water and sewage, that are failing all over our ward, as well 
we must renew and improve our stormwater systems and flood mitigation systems that we sorely overlooked over the 20-year flood event in 2005 and failed again after the 50-year flood event this year. We must be prepared for a 100-year flood. To do this, we must have a credible representative who is willing to reform election funding, limiting fine funding to individuals only, and not allowing any funding from organizations such as developers in the inner city or suburbs to ensure decisions reflect the interests of Ward 7 and those of, uh, and not of other organizations. I look forward to answering your questions and engaging in a lively discussion on these and other issues this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. And uh, introducing last will be uh, Ms. Joylyn Nodwell. Ms. Nodwell, you have two minutes. Yes. Hi, everyone. I want to thank you for coming. I want to also thank Civic Camp for hosting this fine event and for all the other candidates coming out and uh, introducing themselves and participating. Uh, I want to start off by saying a little bit of my background. I don't know if many of you have had a chance to go to my website or read my brochures, but I am an NCCP coach. Uh, I coach swimmers of all ages, all levels, all backgrounds. And I think that my strength is certainly working with people and having, providing a human voice down at City Council. I think a lot of uh, some of life's greatest lessons can be learned through sport, such as goal setting, focusing, teamwork, failure and perseverance, challenging yourself, and, uh, and most importantly, feeling proud. And I think uh, a good counselor represents uh, all those qualities, and I feel as though those strengths will be uh, definitely an asset uh, down at City Council. I was uh, part of my own uh, sort of council at, in high school, where I was grade 10, 11, and 12 representatives. So I, I, I really enjoyed uh, working with the students and the staff towards common goals. And I think that this experience will help me uh, do the same at City Council. Uh, the three tenets of my platform I'd like to share with you today, the first one being transparency, uh, the second one being fiscal responsibility, and the third one being equal representation of all the wards in Ward 7 and all communities are in Ward 7. Um, I see that I'm running out of time, so I'll be really quick here. Uh, transparency, being open government, we'd like to know what goes on at City Hall before, uh, this, the, public gets to, before the public gets to, um, sorry, may, may I start again? Sorry, I only have 15 seconds left. Um, my first issue of my platform is transparency, and what I'm trying to say is that a government needs to be a lot more open in terms of the decisions that are made and how it can be relayed to the public so the public has a chance to engage in the decision-making process before it's too late. And I will talk to you more about the rest of my platform uh, as the debate, uh, sorry, as the forum progresses. So my apologies. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much to Ms. Nodwell. And uh, again, the candidates are on a clock. Some of you can see it running here. The idea being that we'd like to get everybody home in time to watch the Oilers lose tonight. <laughs> That, that hurts. I'm an Oilers fan. I just want you to know that. We're going to begin with the crowdsourced questions, uh, the first round of it. Uh, our first question will be directed firstly to the red chip, which indicates Mr. Taylor, and then secondly to the white chip, indicating Ms. Nodwell. And your question, which you'll have two minutes to answer, is as follows. Do you support legalization of secondary suites in all existing neighborhoods, subject only to reasonable safety concerns? Why or why not? Mr. Taylor, you have two minutes. Thank you. I support legalization of secondary suites in Calgary. It's been brought forward to council a couple of occasions, and they've lost 8-7. What that tells me exactly is what I'm hearing at the doors. Calgarians want secondary suites in certain areas, and some areas they don't. What we need to do is bring it back to the table at council and have an open, honest discussion, and then review it down to whether it's a discretionary or permitted use. Calgarians need to know that secondary suites are available to them. Uh, they have to know the costs involved. One of the things that a separate ventilation system, a separate heating system, a separate electrical panel, those are costly. So we need to address with the provincial government, the Alberta, Alberta Building Code, on what it costs to 
put in a secondary suite. And I believe working with the province and making these small changes and having that honest discussion again, we can legalize secondary suites in Calgary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Ms. Nodwell, your two minutes begin now. Okay. The issue of secondary suites has certainly been a contentious issue lately. There are some communities that welcome secondary suites while there is opposition in others. I believe a lot of misinformation, a lot of past experiences have, has, have contributed to this opposition. And uh, I'm here to let you know that I, I think there is a strong need for secondary suites in the sense that the housing, the housing crisis was, the, the rental market was quite tight before the flood. And as you know, after the flood, it's even more tight. And so by opening up our secondary suites, we will uh, have a lot of residents, more residents available to those uh, that uh, need affordable housing. Uh, I was reading a study actually in Vancouver with regards to their issue with secondary suites and they started introducing them in around the 1980s. They had about a 50% 50, 50 approval uh, during that time and it wasn't until three decades later that uh, they were actually able to approve them across the board. That was in 2004. So while I think that the idea of secondary suites can be promoted in Calgary, it's going to take a bit of time. Uh, and, but with, with some suggestions that I would I have, would be to offer a lot more information via workshops through in, through at the community level so that people can come in and uh, learn a lot more about uh, what's involved in the secondary suites. Uh, another suggestion I have is... Um, uh, sorry, I'm just having a bit of a mind block. Oh yeah, another suggestion I have is opening up lots of public forums such as this so people can come in and voice their concerns. What happens with secondary suites, there needs to be a collaboration as well uh, with regards to the city, the planners, the developers, uh, as well as tenants um, to come in all together to uh, talk about uh, the information that's available for secondary suites. As, as well, the legalization of of suites in existence already. I don't know if you know, but there are over 50,000 illegal suites in Calgary. And so by legalizing, it also protects the tenant um, and, and it protects the landlord from, it, it protects them in, in terms of uh, any issues that they may have in terms of safety. Sorry. Thank you very much, Ms. Nodwell. <laughs> Does anybody have anything they'd like to add on the issue before we go on? No? Seeing none. The next question will be directed first to the blue chip of Councillor Farrell, and that only leaves the black chip of Mr. Alexander to go second. Here is the question, and you'll have two minutes to respond. Do you believe that urban sprawl is a problem for the City of Calgary? And if you do believe it's a problem, what will you do to address that, and what have you done to address it, if you're the incumbent? Very good question, because I think sprawl is the greatest issue that our city faces. Every house in the suburbs costs $4,500 sub $4, subsidy, and we have added 400,000 units since 1995, and we simply cannot afford it. We're working hard to change it, but there is a lot of pushback. The discussion isn't unique to Calgary. Cities across North America are discussing the th same thing and reaching the same conclusion. Growth, when done well, is very good for the city. I've been the driving force behind the new growth management strategy. It's a practical approach to growth that ensures that the developer pays the true cost. It's a cost that our children and our grandchildren won't have to bear. In December, Council will vote on growth management. We'll also be voting on our developer levy. And this is a, whoa, can you hear me now? I'm, pardon me, um, I feel passionately about this issue. This is a huge issue for the prosperity of our city. And who would you rather have at the table for this vote? Thank you very much, Councillor Farrell. As you can tell, Peter's really excited about uh, sprawl. It's, it's his favorite issue. Uh, our uh, next speaker will be uh, Mr. Brent Alexander. Sir, you have two minutes. Hello. Uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful question. And I'll just uh, answer Drew's question now. And you'd rather have me at the table. And for a simple reason, I both have the 
understanding of finance. I've studied finance. I've worked in finance for the last 19 years. No one's going to um, snow me on the numbers. Um, as well, I've also studied urban design. I do not have to be a quick learner on this subject. It's one that I'm already well aware of. Okay. The biggest issue with uh, with urban sprawl is exactly as was discussed before, and it's the subsidization. Um, urban sprawl in itself um, has its costs on individuals who choose to live in the areas, but those are their choices. We need to make sure that they have the choices understood in full, which means they're covering all their costs uh, when they actually choose to buy in suburban areas, as opposed to having us subsidize them. Um, this also goes though for um, subsidization is also counterintuitive in that we also have people subsidizing people who live in single family dwellings in the inner city who live in condos. Um, and, uh, and, and the condos are overtaxed, um, the apartments are overtaxed, and, and we are completely misguided in the way we are set up our, our taxation system, partly because that's why the province insists on it being done. But we really have to fight for a fair tax system that allows for the services that you're using to be what you're paying for in a, in a much more fair way. And that way you, may, you have the decision on an economic basis at your hands as to what you want to do, whether you want to live in the burbs or whether you want to live downtown in the condo or somewhere in between. And, and that will determine how our city develops, but it will not be at the cost of individuals who choose one way or another. It, you will be covering your own costs. And it's the only fair way to do it. It's the best way to do it in an open free market. And it's a way to ensure that we as a city are able to move forward on a, on a financial basis without having to worry about a fiscal cliff that we've been driven over so far. Thank you. No. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. And it looks like Mr. Taylor is chomping at the bit to drop, uh, yeah, not into the water. There you go. You have one minute, sir. Smart, sustainable growth must be balanced with affordability. Replacement of aging infrastructure in Ward 7 must be met with a redevelopment levy to help fund major infrastructure repairs in our ward. I find it very puzzling that I cannot find any documentation on the City of Calgary's website about growth management cash flows of new communities or costs associated to give a validated opinion on what Alderman Farrell is saying. But what I can tell you is right now that we've been subsidizing the East Village for the tune of $30 million a year and there has not been one building built there since 2008. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Taylor. Would anybody else like to speak on the issue? Okay, seeing none, uh, that ends the first round of the questions. Uh, we do have many more to come. Uh, I'd like to remind at this time the candidates to please avoid mentioning any of their opponents by name or by position. Uh, and as well for the audience, uh, I'm seeing that we have a lot of qu questions coming in. That's fantastic to see. Uh, two reminders, please firstly make sure they are specific towards seven. And secondly, because we cannot guarantee to whom the question will end up being addressed because that's determined by random draw, you cannot direct a question at a particular candidate. As an example, if I got a question that said, Mr. Alexander, why is your hair so awesome? Um, I cannot ask that question because if I happen to draw Miss Nodwell's chip, she's not allowed to talk about Mr. Alexander's hair. So please keep it uh, specific towards seven and uh, do not direct it at any particular candidate. All right. Our second round of questioning will begin with a question directed at the blue chip. That's Councillor Farrell. And the second speaker will be the red chip. That is Mr. Taylor. You'll have two minutes to respond, and your question is this. How do you think we can create greater mobility choices, including biking, walking, and transit, in addition to cars, in the city and in this ward in particular? Starting with Councillor Farrell, you have two minutes. Thank you. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. We can start by focusing away from building expensive roads and interchanges to more sustainable modes of transportation, transit. And Crowchild Trail is an excellent example. We had on the books a freeway that was going to cost us about a billion dollars and do some damage to neighboring communities. Um, or we could focus on something more practical and that's what we've chosen to do. Something that focuses on more affordable solutions. 
We also, in, including transit, walking, cycling. We have a cycling strategy. That was my notice of motion. We have seen 30% increase of cycling in our downtown core since 2010, since we introduced the cycling strategy. We are talking about pedestrian safeway, or safety, sorry, connections to transit. Every transit user begins and ends as a pedestrian, and we haven't connected them. We are talking about a new pedestrian strategy for our downtown and creating new walkable communities. We're talking about a transit network, a bus rapid transit network that, that extends and connects east-west, north-south. And once we've moved beyond bus rapid transit, we'll move to other technologies, including innovations like urban gondola, which we're actually talking about for the northwest of the city by the Foothills Hospital. We've got a lot of work to do, but we've shifted our priorities, and it's a good move that'll take us into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Farrell. The next response uh, for two minutes will be uh, Mr. Kevin Taylor. Uh, because I want to make sure I get it all in, I'm going to just read right from my notes. I think we have a great mobility choices right now. As far as health and recreation goes, Calgary is a leader in providing its citizens with an incredible system of pathways that link through our great city. Today, approximately 700 kilometers of pathways connect along the Bow and Elbow Rivers, Fish Creek Provincial Park, Nose Creek, West Nose Creek, the Western Irrigation District Canal, and the perimeter of Glenmore Reservoir. With our new planning policies requiring complete communities, we will have recreation and pathways there. We need roads fixed ASAP in Ward 7 for both cars and biking. Over 77% of Calgarians drive. The city has begun the discussion for planning citywide transportation issues that supports the growth of Calgary. Route Ahead is an example of this. On the last note, raising the seniors pass, 60% was unacceptable. What is our criteria? Safe, flexible, user-friendly, affordable transportation choices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Uh, would anybody else like to speak on this before we move on? Seeing none. The next question will be responded to first by the black chip of Mr. Alexander, followed by the remaining chip, Ms. Nodwell. You'll have two minutes to respond to the following question. With the government initiating a plan to support local sustainability in the food system, can we expect a positive move towards urban agriculture in the city of Calgary? Mr. Alexander, you have two minutes. Thank you for that question. We certainly should be able to. There's no reason not to move towards more sustainable local agriculture within our community, whether it's on public lands or on private lands where it's encouraged that people harvest other people's gardens uh, on, on agreement, obviously, um, and, uh, and allow people to, uh, to plant on, on fallow gr uh, ground. There's also other issues that need to be addressed relative to, uh, to urban agriculture, and that is maintaining of, uh, of, of certain species within uh, one's backyard. Um, whether it's a chicken or a rabbit or a cat or a dog, it really should be immaterial to your neighbor as to what you're keeping in your backyard. And if you're using it as a pet or if you're using it for protein supply, it's really immaterial to anybody else. Uh, these are fantastic cheap alternatives for, uh, for um, uh, people to get healthy supplies, uh, and to self-supply certain of their health needs. And uh, we need to move forward with this. Other cities have done it. It is not a unique situation in Calgary. Um, we've seen uh, uh, excellent opportunities to, to copy and emulate uh, both Vancouver and Toronto uh, amongst various other American cities. It's not something that needs to be studied further. It needs something that needs to be acted upon now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. And uh, following that, uh, for two minutes, Ms. Joylyn Nodwell. Ms. Nodwell. Hey, thank you. Well, the issue of urban agriculture, I definitely think it's uh, pertinent, especially in, this, in our climate, due to the fact that we uh, can grow only certain times of the year. And so with regards to what I would suggest to encouraging urban agriculture is to continue uh, at the community level uh, by encouraging farmers markets, community harvest. I'm not, not sure if you're familiar with that program. It's a program that uses uh, that uh, 
encourages those that have fruit growing in their yards to uh, bring them out and share them with their neighbors, uh, whether it's zucchini, apples, raspberries, uh, sort of at the community level, we can, we can definitely foster that program. Also, uh, community fruit stands is another way we can encourage urban agriculture. With regards to livestock, uh, there needs to be more research uh, in the sense that uh, having uh, livestock such as chickens in your backyard uh, has been noted there. Research, I've researched it myself, they're, they're noisy and um, they can also uh, be difficult to uh, control the odor of, of course, when they go to the washroom. It's, it's, it's an issue, uh, especially if your neighbors, uh, especially living in Calgary, are often are, we're right up against the neighbor next door. And so, I mean, if you're going to be raising chickens in your backyard, you're going to have to make sure the rest of your neighborhood is going to concur. Um, so I, once again, lots of more research with regards to livestock, but I have no issue supporting urban agriculture with regards to vegetables, fruit, um, and, uh, and, and, and sharing it amongst your community members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Nodwell. Would anybody like to add anything to this before we go on? No? Noisy and hard to control the odor. My mother used to say the same thing about me and my brother. Moving on to the next round of questions. The first response to the first question will be Mr. Alexander. And the second response will be Ms. Nodwell again. You'll have two minutes to answer the following question. With a vacancy rate approaching 0%, what long-term action will you take to ensure young professionals and students have a place to live in Calgary? Mr. Alexander, you have two minutes. Thank you. I'm glad I didn't uh, barge in on the secondary suites earlier. Uh, secondary suites has to be a primary issue that we address, um, and we need to legalize it throughout the city. Uh, there have been roadblocks, um, and, it's, and we haven't got past the roadblocks, partly because uh, certain aldermen are paying more attention to their R1 neighborhoods than to the needs of the city as a whole, um, and particularly uh, students, et cetera. And it's understandable. They've made an investment. They want to maintain it in a certain way. We need to work with them to get past this concern so that the illegal suites that exist all over the place can actually be legalized. So that's one element of it. The other element is we need to also encourage investment in apartment buildings and, uh, and other rental structures, uh, whether it's uh, uh, in whichever community and whether, whether it's also in seniors' complexes or otherwise, to actually produce more available alternative housing stock that is, uh, that is possible, whether it's attainable homes or otherwise. Um, there's so many different models to, to work with, and we really do have to uh, see what is holding back these investments um, and, uh, and whether it's a, a zoning issue that we can improve upon or otherwise. Um, there are so many different ways that uh, we can't just rely on the condominialization of all of our uh, housing stock and hope that individual entrepreneurs fill the void. We really do have to move forward on this in, in different fashion. Um, uh, the second issue, uh, or the second part of that though, is just uh, the uh, availability of affordable housing in general. And we are currently not planning affordable housing stock in enough neighborhoods. And, and we're not even talking about necessarily subsidized. The at market or just below market housing stock needs to be in all the communities in Ward 7 that are gentrifying. Gentrif gentrification is not a horror in itself, but it often pushes out and, and decreases the socioeconomic diversity in neighborhoods, and we need to address this up front and be aware of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. And the next response goes to Ms. Joylyn Nodwell. You have two minutes. As I said before, uh, trying to get secondary suites approved in Calgary has been a bit of a struggle, but uh, I think with the right approach, we can get uh, a lot more consensus, a lot more support for that. Uh, that would definitely open up a lot of more availability for residences, uh, places for people to live at affordable, affordable places to live. Uh, what I'd like to also talk about are those that are opposed to uh, multi-use neighborhoods. What I mean by multi-use is I mean a neighborhood that incorporates uh, high-rise towers uh, or uh, residences that will allow uh, families with more than two children to rent. I find there's an extreme lacking, a lack of that uh, type of housing in our city. And so I think this opposition st stems from those that just aren't aware of, of, uh, of how uh, beneficial it can be. 
And I, I would like to t let Calgarians know that we should embrace uh, a diversity in our neighborhoods as well as inclusivity, uh, meaning that uh, it's actually healthy to have a neighborhood that's not just strictly um, single family dwellings, but can, can open, be open to uh, multiple, multiple family units, as well as a, a densification in terms of uh, buildings that can house a lot more than just one family. I just wanna, uh, we're sitting here at Eau Claire Market today, and um, you might not be aware, but there, was plan there were plans in the past to uh, redevelop this area into uh, a development that would see businesses and, and uh, services, stores, shops on the lower level and then uh, high rises uh, above. And uh, unfortunately that plan never went through, but that would be an example of, of uh, a step in the right direction. And I hope you would open, open up to and, and think forward and as, as that is a, a wonderful uh, way that Calgary can grow without um, encouraging too much sprawl on the, on the outskirts of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nodwell. Would anybody else like to speak on this issue before we move on to the next question? No? All right, so the next question will first be responded to by Councillor Farrell, and then by Mr. Taylor. <coughs> and the question you'll have two minutes to respond to is, what would you do to support the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative, and how would your efforts improve that initiative. Councillor Farrell, you have two minutes. Thank you. The motto for the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative is enough for all, and I think that's a very apt model for a place like Calgary. And I'm very proud of this initiative. It was unanimous at Council, and it talks about building partnerships and how to reduce, prevent, and eliminate poverty. The City of Calgary is just one partner. We're with United Way and many, many others. We're doing what we can. Um, we implemented a low-income transit pass that provides transit passes to many, many more people. We have programs like Critical Hours. It's an after-school program that helps prevent crime for children that are really vulnerable. And it helps, it's a gang prevention program and one thing that we've talked about for many years, we've never been able to implement, even for the corporation of the city of Calgary, was a living wage, and I believe very strongly in a living wage. The library, interestingly, provides huge services in both prevention and education. So they will continue to play a huge role and we're part of the initiative. I think more important than anything was the lessons we learned during the flood. We responded like a city like no other. And it was because of those intimate connections that people have with each other, neighbor to neighbor. It's from the community gardens, it's from the block parties, it's from the community barbecues. Those connections we used during the flood. We need to take that energy and harness it to eliminate poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Farrell. And the next response will go to Mr. Kevin Taylor. Mr. Taylor, you have two minutes. The Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative is a new initiative that was passed by Council in May of 2013. So I can only comment on my core values of affordability in Calgary. We can't keep increasing our rate of taxes or we'll keep increasing our number of people in the poverty level, below and above the line. As stated by Affordable Housing, allow low to moderate income households to afford shelter, work within the city, and have the city give up some surplus, la surplus land so we can build affordable housing. Right now, because it's such a new initiative, I would just follow the recommendations set out in the report. Building community hubs, employment centers, fiscal vulnerability, and access to services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Would anybody else like to speak on this? The issue is poverty, correct? Not the, homelessness, poverty? The issue is the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative. What would you do to support it? Can I put it 
chip in? It, I don't you'd have like to speak to... for the full two minutes, do I? It, it's only one minute, so you're in luck. <laughs> I'll be brief here. Um, I think it's important not to address poverty uh, after the fact that the treating the the person after the after they've uh, been on the been on the streets, been homeless, suffered from the symptoms. I think it's also important to treat the root of the cause of poverty, and that begins early on. Um, I think programs such as Cups, uh, which is Calgary Urban Project, needs uh, a lot of these initiatives um, attack the problem at the grassroots, and we need to make sure that we have a lot more collaborative efforts such as that. As well as there are programs out there, uh, I don't know if you heard of the program called Leftovers. It's a program that, uh, that reaches out to restaurants. I mean, if you can imagine all the waste that goes at the end of the day, uh, um, after the end of a, of a busy uh, dining evening, if you imagine all that waste or imagine all the waste that um, happens at Costco or Safeway, there are lots of initiatives, I think, that can be put forward to uh, providing uh, food for the for the impoverished, for the, infor uh, the less fortunate, um, and I so, so I don't think so. What my, my what I want to say is that it's not just uh, treating the the poverty uh, the the poverty population uh, at that at the stage at where they're at where they're they've already been through the symptoms, but to actually treat the root of the cause, and then I believe that starts at the grassroots with programs that start uh, right. when they put them in there. Sorry, with young families. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Nodwell. I tend to talk. <laughs> I, I guess you could cash in your other I chip. I tend to talk, yes. <laughs> I could actually do karaoke on here, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Would anybody else like to add anything to that before we move on? No? Seeing none? All right. The fourth round of questions will begin with a question directed first to Mr. Taylor and second to... Ms. Nodwell, you'll have two minutes to respond, and the question is this. Will you commit to releasing a list of your campaign donors before Election Day? Why or why not? Mr. Taylor, you have two minutes. In 2010, I made a pledge to release my, release my donors list. It was released uh, the second, I was the second person in 2010 to release it. This year, I made a pledge to release it again. It was released the week of nomination day, and it's been updated three times this week. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. And uh, following up, Ms. Joylyn Nodwell, you have two minutes. Sure. I think it's really important uh, for candidates to disclose their contributions. It says a lot about the candidate. Um, and for sure, we disclosed uh, before the election, and we continue to update this periodically, and we will disclose again, of course, after the fact. I think if you look at the contributions, there are some candidates that have been receiving donations um, from very, uh, from more, more than, more, more focus on one industry than another, and I do believe that that says a lot about the candidate. I think it's a, a strong candidate will have contributions from a wide variety of resources, uh, especially, especially uh, residents in Ward 7 and uh, organizations um, that, uh, that the candidate believes in. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Nodwell. Would anybody else like to speak on this? Seeing none. The final question of the first half of the evening uh, will first be responded to by Councillor Farrell and then by Mr. Alexander. And the question that you'll have two minutes to respond to is this. How will you ensure all Calgarians have access to recreational and sports facilities that they need for their ongoing health and well-being? Councillor Farrell, you have two minutes. Thank you. City of Council has adopted a 10-year sport strategy, and we have a plan that is associated with it. It talks about the importance of sport and active, healthy lifestyle for a healthy citizenry. Currently, we're struggling to fund new rec centers in new communities and sports fields. And we're also struggling to take care of what we have. And that is a critical issue for many communities that have arenas and aging infrastructure regarding sport and that really goes back to the growth issue. 
We need to take care of what we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Farrell. And uh, with two minutes, uh, Mr. Brent Alexander. Thank you. It's an excellent question. We have, uh, I have a young family, a uh, six-year-old and three-and-a-half-year-old. We use recreation facilities significantly. And I think when you do have a family, you see just what, how much is lacking and how far you have to go to, for certain things. Uh, for uh, eight and a half months of the year, um, you, we only have access to one indoor swimming pool for all of Ward 7. Um, 90,000 residents, it makes absolutely no sense, and no one's advocating for additional facilities in Ward 7. We need to really consider what it is that we're lacking, how we can move forward with it. Individual community associations cannot, and they do not have the resources to move forward on these items all, all by themselves. We need to have somebody who's willing to advocate on behalf of a number of uh, community associations in regards to what is missing in certain areas so that we can have additional facilities and better hours and better facilities in, the, in Ward 7. It is, it is part of the problem is, is the subsidization of other communities, including East Village and, and the suburbs, that we need to bring those resources back into the general stream so that we can actually provide those, uh, uh, those services to Ward 7 residents, regardless whether they're down in Sunnyside or up in Dalhousie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. Would anybody like to add anything on this? No? Seeing none. Close. <laughs> We're now about halfway through our evening, and so we are going to take a short 15-minute break. Just a reminder that during this break, you can submit uh, any specific Ward 7 and not specific to any one candidate questions that you have into the box over here behind the sound booth. Uh, please write your question on the card that is provided there at the box. Uh, we ask everyone to be back in your seat before the 15 minutes are up so we can end on time tonight. Thank you very much to the candidates so far, and we'll see everybody in 15 minutes. Welcome back to the second half of this evening's entertainment. Uh, we're going to have now the talent portion. I understand interpretive dance is first up, and Mr. Taylor volunteered to go? No? No? All right. All right. We're going to begin uh, with our first question of the second round of crowdsourced questions that came off the internet. So Calgarians as a whole voted on these. Uh, thank you, by the way, for all of the questions you submitted uh, during the intermission. Turn it up to 11. Uh, so we, um, uh, we went through them, and there were some terrific questions in there. It's too bad that we can't ask them all, but uh, time limits us to asking four, and we think that those four are a good cross-section of the ones that we were getting. So, but first, we're going to go back to the website. And the first question will be addressed firstly by Councillor Farrell. And uh, just in the interest of some of the folks who came up during the intermission for the remainder of the night, we will be referring to the incumbent as Ms. Farrell. And uh, the second uh, response will be Mr. Brent Alexander. All right. So the question that you'll have two minutes to respond to is as follows. Calgary is the only Canadian city of its size with no municipal grants directly mm. for artists. What role should the city play in investing in its artists? Ms. Farrell, you have two minutes. Thank you. Well, a thriving arts sector means a thriving city and it helps us define ourselves it brings a community to life and is a major economic driver downtown 10 years ago was an empty place after work and there was a significant crime issue the olympic plaza was a place that very few people wanted to go to and now every night the streets are vibrant there's nightlife and there's something to do, you'd have a hard time making a choice. So I helped develop Calgary Arts Development Authority, and we developed now a new arts plan where we're consulting with Calgarians what the next step is for our arts in the city of Calgary. But it's interesting because despite the successes of the arts and even the economic development of the city, um, realizes how important the arts are, we still have to defend it at budget times. We need to take care of our artists. We need to provide affordable housing for our artists. Calgary is a very difficult place to live. If you're an artist, they live well below the poverty line. We need to promote 
incubators, we need to give more funding to the arts. Although we have a wonderful art sector and they're exporting tremendous talent to other cities, they're struggling in their own city because we underfund it. So I remain committed to the arts and I think Calgarians do too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Farrell. And the next response will go to Mr. Brent Alexander. Sir, you have two minutes. Thank you. The arts are incredibly important to any community. And they range all the way from your, your uh, church and school plays that your children are in, all the way to professional organizations that come through our city and everything in between. It's really important, though, that we recognize what's particularly difficult in Calgary on the artistic sector is this boom-bust cycle that we experience in the oil and gas industry that sucks all the energy literally out of any space that they might have that they can afford, and they have to uproot, go somewhere else for either their production space, um, their di display space, what, whatever the medium it is that they're performing in. And it's very, very difficult. What we need to do is, is uh, more, more important than actually funding individual artists, is create a sustainable environment that artists can actually work in, incubators perhaps, hubs, but also throughout <coughs> communities and not just in one place, not just the Epcor Center. We need to have them in various communities, such as the King Edward Space that Sea Space is working on. It's an organization that I'm involved in the board to ensure that an, uh, a place exists for various groups across various different mediums can inhabit a building, sustain it without subsidy once it's up and running, and thrive off each other, learn entrepreneurial skills, work with each other in different ways that allow them to actually earn more income in different fashions, what have you. And we can do this model in various different communities and it's very important that it is in different communities so that we all benefit from having the artists in our midst. The worst thing you can do with anything, whether it's arts or people living in one place or, or businesses, is to single zone things or put them in certain areas because we really thrive by having this interplay between artists and business and kids and seniors and everybody together in different places. And if we keep on separating them or, or hiving off in different areas as opposed to integrating them, we won't have the full benefit. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. Would anybody else like to speak? I see Mr. Taylor's got a chip up. Sir, you have one minute to respond. Calgary does have uh, an arts, a great arts program, and they do a great job. What I'd like to add is we put aside 1% of our infrastructure budget last year, which was $1.1 billion. So that's $11 million to go to art. Instead of building fishes on the side of Glenmore Trail, I think we should give a lot of that money to the artists and to the spaces they need. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Taylor. Anybody else? No? <laughs> All right, the next question will be first addressed by Mr. Taylor, and then secondly by Ms. Nodwell. <laughs> We've got one candidate who's seven foot five and another one who's five foot seven. So. The question, uh, again, first to Mr. Taylor, and you'll have two minutes to respond. Do you believe that Calgary requires a city charter? What powers does the city need that it does not currently have? Sir, you have two minutes. Woo! <laughs> okay. Um, the province promised a year ago that they would deliver a city charter before this election. So I would expect that the city charter is coming up any day now. That was a promise that Doug Griffiths made to the citizens of Calgary that we'd have a city charter uh, before the next election. As for extra taxation powers, uh, we only have one taxpayer. That's you and I. So I believe the city can have a, a charter and uh, greater responsibility but no more taxation powers because all that would do would have the provincial government adjust their taxation to the taxpayers, which is 
you and I, and therefore hurt small businesses in Calgary. So I believe we should have a charter, but no extra taxation rates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. And uh, with two minutes to respond, Ms. Joylyn Nodwa. Uh, actually, I actually have to disagree. Um, I don't think a city charter uh, would, is important since there's a, there's a uh, governing body, the provincial government, which takes care of a lot of what a city charter would, would have in, in the sense that there'd be a duplication of, of the two powers. I think um, if the city was going to have the extra power from a city charter, uh, what's to say our taxes are going to uh, continue to uh, rise uh, to increase at the rate of inflation? I mean, right now our, tax, uh, our taxes have gone up uh, significantly, significantly over the past three years. And if we give that power, a city charter, to our mayor, um, what's to say that uh, he's not going to continue uh, increasing our taxes um, because he has more power now with the Charter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nodwell. Would anybody else like to speak on this? I see Ms. Farrell. You have one minute. Thank you. City Charters are not just about taxation. Under our Constitution, cities are creatures, creatures of the province. The rules were formed when Canada was a rural economy when most people lived on the family farm. 82% of Albertans live in cities now, and we're still dealing with a government structure where most people lived on the family farm. Campaign finance reform? We can't do that without provincial approval. Our market value assessment, which I would imagine most people don't like, is a regressive tax. We can't do that. The province tells us how to collect those taxes. Our building codes, we have a better idea of what's most appropriate to build after the flood than the province does. Cities across Canada are asking for city charters and we were promised by the province during the last election that we would get a big city charter. And I'm talking about a big city charter, Edmonton and Calgary. But the province is talking about a civics charter. Calgary is not the same as Ed Edson. We need to be treated differently as a big city. Thank All you. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Farrell. Would anybody else like to speak on this? Mr. Alexander with his first chip of the night. Go ahead, sir. You have one minute. The city charter is imperative. If we have responsibilities, we also need to have rights to be able to govern how we actually take care of those responsibilities. And part of that is funding. It should not be at the expense of additional layers of taxes, as, as others have implied. It should be a question of an agreement between the levels of government that levels uh, different taxation authorities simply are, are split so that we are actually taking the taxes to fund the responsibilities that we are given as a city. So we no longer have to go cap in hand to either the province or the federal government, and we do not rely on the province to balance their budget on the back of civic infrastructure requirements. This is what the problem is to date, um, and we really knew, do need to have that independence so that we can actually move forward on a known basis instead of having to have this unknown entity as to whether or not we're going to be funded for any type of infrastructure that requires. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Anybody like to add anything or expand on their answer? Seeing none. All right. Those of you who still have chips left, which is all of you, can put them away for the time being because you cannot use them in this next round. This is my favorite part of the evening. We call this the how round. Ooh. It's a quick round of questions. Sometimes it's difficult providing specifics in a small brochure or on a website that you want to ensure isn't too wordy. This is your chance to provide details. It is the how round. I've visited your website and looked at your public statements and uh, picked one of your top priorities or one of the things that you said you want to accomplish in office. Each candidate will be given 45 seconds to tell us exactly how you plan to accomplish the goal that you think is so important. Please be as specific as possible and avoid giving any background as to why the goal is important. This is the time for details, so use all 45 seconds to provide them. The first candidate to answer will be Red Chip, Mr. Taylor. 
Mr. Taylor, this is your question. You will have 45 seconds to respond, sir. You said, ensure future growth in old and new residential and commercial entities is com complementary to community neighborhoods. In 45 seconds, how do you make that happen? That's a great question. Uh, in our neighborhood, I'm on the land use committee. And what we find is on our land use committee in our neighborhood, we don't talk to other communities on their land use issues. But we all have the same issues. What I'd like to do is form um, a coalition where all the land use members meet on a regular basis to see what's going on in each community and start that right away. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. The next question goes to Mr. Alexander. Mr. Alexander, in 45 seconds, you said, limit tax increases on a per capita basis in Ward 7 to no more than inflation for the next four years. In 45 seconds, how do you do that? You do that by making taxes fair across the city. So it does require taxation to be made fair, stop the subsidies in the suburbs and in the inner city, such as East Village. When we do that, Ward 7 will be raising more than enough money to fund the issues that need to be covered in Ward 7. With the other items having to be funded by the funds that are being created out of the other wards or being uh, raised out of the wards, they may see significantly higher taxes, but that is the choices that they've made in regards to where they want to live and they should be able to cover, cover those costs. It is a market-based system. They're free to live where they want, so long as they don't expect subsidization. Thank you, sir. The next question is for Ms. Farrell. Ms. Farrell, you said, Ward 7 communities need protection from the damaging impacts of cut-through traffic. In 45 seconds, how do you accomplish that? Well, we have been accomplishing that, but it's, um, it's a difficult task because we get many, many requests in our office for um, mitigation against cut-through traffic. We've got communities upstream who want to get, and the individuals want to get to their workplace or their home as quickly as possible. And, um, and it's really damaging the quality of life of those downstream neighborhoods. So what we're doing is we advocate for the residents, we help them through a process, if they talk about traffic calming, what does that look like? Uh, and and uh, but a little word of caution for communities that want to have traffic calming is neighbors need to talk with neighbors. So what we do is try and get a majority or a consensus before we move forward with any type of traffic calming, speed right. humps, little traffic circles, that sort of thing. Thank you. But thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Farrell. And the last question goes to Ms. Nodwell. Ms. Nodwell, you said that we need to increase the level of transparency in the reporting and decision-making process at City Hall. In 45 seconds, how do we do that? I think transparency needs to occur at all levels of government, but my in influence here would be the municipal level. I think we need to doc have better documentation at, with city administration, better, better communication between what we hear that goes on at City Hall and what, we actually, what is actually revealed in the end. A lot of projects get, um, get pushed through uh, and a lot of residents have come to me telling me that they didn't uh, get to voice their concern about the development until after the fact and that they were invited to a public forum only to be told that uh, uh, they were voices were their voices felt like they were coming against a, a blank wall. And so I'd like to ha definitely uh, in, uh, put forward, forward motions that would encourage better disclosure, better accountability, better, better transparency at all levels of uh, the processes and the municipal level. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Notwell. <laughs> all right, so that ends the how round. You can pull your chips back out and take a deep <laughs> breath. The hard part's over. Or has it just begun? Because I have in my hands right now four questions that were submitted by you, the members of the audience. These represent a good cross-section of the questions that we did get. They are specific uh, towards seven or address issues that are uh, of particular concern here. And uh, 
Just as a reminder, we are still drawing to see who answers which questions and in which order. So there is no guarantee if you wrote this question down thinking you'd like to hear one particular candidate answer, there's no guarantee that candidate will actually have to answer the question. So the first question will be answered first by Ms. Nodwell and second by Mr. Alexander. You have two minutes to respond. The question is this. What specific actions will you take to address traffic congestion on Crow Child Trail? Ms. Nodwell, you have two minutes. Well, uh, Crow Child Trail definitely gets a lot of use, especially during peak hours. I would like to see some interchanges uh, put forward at certain uh, pressure points, uh, particularly right around where the university is and uh, further down uh, in Kensington. I know there have been uh, lots of opposition, especially with regards to Kensington area due to residents um, concerned about uh, the infrastructure that's going to be going in. But I think with good uh, planning and uh, consultation with the right engineers, we can get this project going to uh, keep the Crowchild Trail traffic running smoothly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nodwell. And Mr. Alexander, you have two minutes. Thank you for this question. It's excellent. We have a problem with planning where the communities are only brought into the discussion after the fact. It's a huge issue when communities have a lot of value to be added in regards to what can be possibly done in certain circumstances. The Cochal Trail is a case in point. $900,000 was unanimously agreed to by the council to actually put forth a planning process with no community consultation requirements whatsoever. There was no learning from other programs such as 16th Avenue, which was a dismal failure until the communities were brought into it and caused for ex extensive um, overruns and, cost delay and, and costly delays in time for people who had to use that route. We want to avoid that moving forward. We need to have the communities in at the front end. Secondly, uh, the format was what was being studied as opposed to the outcomes. We have to be very focused on outcomes, and that means flow through uh, Crowchild Trail from north to south. It is broken right now, and we need to start fixing it immediately, but we don't have $2 billion, which is what Stantec actually said it would likely cost to build the freeway option that was approved for study by council. It's unrealistic, and we don't have the money. It would take probably 20 years to be able to get the money, so we have to start dealing with things now. And there's a lot of different uh, formats that have been proven in many cities around North America to go away from a freeway model towards something much more approachable to a, an actual boulevard or a city street which has better flow. Uh, you, you take away the left-hand turns, et cetera, during rush hour lanes, or to actually take away the, the left-hand turns altogether, allow more uh, throw, flow through and uh, back and forth. And the reason why this is important is because there's actually limitations in regards to Crow Child even where there are no lights. And we have to realize that we're never going to fix extra access into the downtown or onto Glenmore Trail. So we have already bottlenecks that are built in the system, and we only have to build towards that bottleneck level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. <laughs> Would anyone else like to speak on this? Ms. Farrell with the chip. You have one minute. Thank you. The Crowchild Trail plan that came from city administration was based on an outdated idea, an outdated idea that talks about a freeway going through our city. And it was Alderman John Marr and I that brought forward a motion to council to kill that study. So that's dead. What we're talking about now is something far more sustainable. We're talking about something that's far more cost effective and practical. We're talking about protecting and enhancing the communities adjacent to Crow Child Trail, and we're talking about specific pinch points. What can we do to ease congestion without damaging the communities that are next to them? So for example, the river. The river and the bridge over the river is far too complicated. It's actually dangerous. Can we make it better? Can we ease those pinch points? That's what we're looking at now. We have a whole department that's studying it with tremendous consultation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farrell. Anybody else? Mr. Taylor, want to jump in with your third and final chip? You have one minute. 
I travel Crotel Trail every day, so I can tell you the times I've spent where it's taken an hour, an hour and a half to get home. Crotel Trail has been over capacity since 1979. It's the second busiest road in Calgary. Council has failed to address that for years. But one of the main issues is when they gave the project out to two different engineering firms, the engineering firms worked with the scope of work that they were given by administration. What we need to do is give an engineer a carte blanche in his mind to come up with an idea, rather than working with the scope of the project that he was told to work with. So he can actually think outside the box and create something that protects our community and moves traffic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Would anybody like to add anything? All right, it should be noted that all four candidates spoke on that, so if you submitted that question, well done. Clearly there was a lot of appetite. The next question submitted from the audience this evening will first be answered by Ms. Farrell and secondly by Mr. Taylor. The question, and you will have two minutes to respond, is as follows. The development of the East Village has and will continue to have a direct positive impact on the residents in the southern part of Ward 7. Can you clarify your perspective on the East Village development? Starting with Ms. Farrell, you have two minutes. Thank you. Well, when I first got elected, East Village was a wasteland. It's a toxic site. There was no development on it for decades, even though there was lots of planning. And it, um, it was a piece of property in the middle of our downtown that was sitting empty, and it was not moving forward. It was council that found a way to do it, a creative way to do it, through tax incremental financing. And I know some have mentioned that there's a subsidy. There is no subsidy to East Village. What we've done is we... What we have done is we will be collecting tax in that community once we build it up and it, it will pay back the loan, the loan that we provided in order to build it right. And so I am very proud of East Village. It's one of the most important decisions that this council has made and it will be a vibrant community that will enhance all of Calgary. So when you look at downtown, downtown raises half, a full 50% of all our revenue. All revenue put together, 50% comes from the downtown. We need to ensure that our downtown remains an economic driver for the city of Calgary. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farrell. And the next response goes to Mr. Kevin Taylor. Sir, you have two minutes. The East Village absolutely will get built over time. It was flooded this year, so I think we'll have to come up with some flood mitigation for the East Village. There's two towers going in there right now. Uh, in terms of subsidy, uh, the East Village, uh, CLMC was given 29 acres of land to develop East Village with for free. If that's not a subsidy, I don't know what is. But we will build it, and um, there's 49 acres of land there. 29 of it was given away for free, less than market value. To me, that's a subsidy, and that's all I'm going to say on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Would anybody like to add anything? Mr. Alexander, you have one minute, sir. Thanks. Uh, when you bring in a tax base such as the Bow, which is the largest single tax base of any single structure in Western Canada, and you put those taxes solely towards a development called East Village. That means you're taking out of general revenues for the benefit of everybody in the city and you're putting it and you're subsidizing one particular development. That's what a subsidy is. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's a, done in the same format as a, a suburban development. The point is the BOW has nothing to do with the East Village. We're using it strictly to finance the East Village. East Village is a market-based development. It should give, cover its own, uh, own costs and we should be able to benefit as a whole from it and not have to subsidize it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. Would anybody like to add anything? Okay. Can I say something quickly? Uh, sure, yeah. The, you've got a minute to say as much as you'd like. 
With regards to East Village, I would like everyone to do some research and find out just how much the city has spent revitalizing it. And uh, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Ms. Nodwell, would anybody like to add anything? No? Another very popular question. Congratulations to all of you. All right. Our second round will be kicked off with a question that will first be answered by Ms. Farrell and second by Mr. Alexander. And the question is this. Would you support the North Central LRT or the Southeast LRT, and why? Uh, Ms. Farrell, you have two minutes. Thank you. Well, we're trying not to think of them as two separate LRTs, but one continuous line called the Green Line. But what Council has directed is that we look at what technology is appropriate at the right time. So we've got bus rapid transit that we could move to LRT when the time is right, when we've got the customers to use it, when we've got the density next to the train stations. Right now, North Central, whether it is Center Street or Edmonton Trail, on Center Street we've got 30,000 Calgarians who take the bus every day. We are leaving thousands of Calgarians at the curb. We estimate that if we put rail up either Centre or Edmonton Trail, we could increase that to 100,000 almost immediately. So we've done a cost-benefit analysis. That cost-benefit analysis looks at economic, of course, it looks at environment, and it looks at social. Transit is an important principle. We want to have every community in the city linked to transit. But it's important we spend the money where it best best benefits the most people and there's a greater return. So the North Central LRT or bus rapid transit, whichever we decide is the appropriate route to go, um, is by far the most important route in all of our transit structure. Southeast leg of the LRT could go partially down, however it actually rates the bottom of our cost benefit analysis. But what's wonderful about all this is communities want transit. It shows a real shift from building roads like the old Crow Child Trail tra uh, study to transit. I think that's something to celebrate. What we need is a national transit strategy. Canada is one of the few countries that does not have a national transit strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farrell. And the next response goes to Mr. Alexander. Sir, you have two minutes. Great. Thank you. I actually agree with everything Drew just said. It's wonderful to hear you're actually talking factually, and, uh, and it makes it very easy to support. On that basis, I, I, I also want to add that we, we, we need to recognize that people do have uh, different modes of transit that they want to use, and wh whether that is uh, pedestrian, um, or cycling, or uh, uh, or by uh, bus, or or any other mode of transit, as well as by automobile, and we have to make it as intermodal as possible because that is what's going to encourage people to actually use transit as much as possible. Is to know that they can actually take their bike to a certain place, park it, go on to transit, etc. So yes, very much uh, north central, um, southeast. It is really one line. We really have to look at that. And if Southeast really has other ways to make them more appealable, um, more appealing, sorry, then, then so be it. But that'll mean that they are going to commit to higher densities along the line, et cetera. It is a huge problem in the Southeast. We know there's very few ways into the downtown for them, which are not already choked full. And it's a little disingenuous to say they wouldn't use transit just because they're not using the current very poor bus systems that already service that area. But the point is we do have to allow people to almost bid on what is going to be the most reasonable route forward first. And right now, it's hands down North Central. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. And I would remind you, please, sir, to avoid referring to any of the other candidates specifically. Would anybody else like to speak on this issue before we move on? 
No? The final question will be answered first by Ms. Nodwell and second by Mr. Taylor. And the question is related to the floods. Sunnyside was flooded in 2009. If you were the alderman for the last four years, or presumably for the next four years, what specific actions would you take to prevent flooding from reoccurring in Sunnyside? I can relate to this one well. Uh, our family lives in Bowness, and we were flooded badly with over eight and a half feet of water in our basement. And so uh, I'm very familiar with living in the flood, low-lying areas, the floodplain, floodway. Um, with regards to Sunnyside in particular, um, had I been elected council back then, I would have ensured that backflow valves uh, were introduced in the suit in there in the uh, in the lines, so as to prevent uh, flowing uh, sewage backup. My apologies, for sewage backup in, in basements. And when the table when the water table rises, that's uh, that's one way, definitely a good way to mitigate. Uh, seepage into the basement. Um, so for sure I would have ensured that. I have also would probably look at the floodgates um, as, as something that I know what, I, I was reading a report and it said that it takes quite a long time for the floodgates to open and close. And so that's another issue I would look at. Um, it shouldn't take 30 minutes to open or close a floodgate gate, especially when floods come so fast. Um, definitely I would look at the floodgates and the backflow valve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nodwell. And uh, second to response to this question is Mr. Kevin Taylor. Sir, you have two minutes. When the flood happened, I spent uh, nine days and eight nights in Sunnyside, helping people out, seeing what happened, seeing the damage, talking to people. And it was not the Bow River that flooded them. It was the stormwater, the stormwater that comes down from up above. One of the things we could do, and I, I've been to the meetings in Sunnyside since the flood, one of them would be to, and the city is doing this, they're automating the gates. But in the past, nobody was allowed to touch the gates. So if a fireman and your first responder got to the gates first, he wasn't allowed to touch it. And this year, on the second flood on July 5th, the fireman was standing there and saying, I can't touch those gates. Somebody ran over with a pipe wrench, opened the gate, and the water drained out. So that's one of the things. The stormwater, when the Bow River rises, and they close the gates to prevent backup into the community. What we need to do is a backflow valve, preventer valve, a pumping station so that can pump the water eight feet higher and out. And it's, a, it's an easy fix. It doesn't cost a lot of money and it will put the residents in Sunnyside to rest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Would anybody like to add anything? Ms. Farrell, you have one minute. Thank you. Well, um, early on in the 2000s, council decided to cut the drainage budget. So that's where I want to caution when people talk about tax cuts, is what the impacts of those cuts can often mean, is deferring maintenance. So council made a decision, I voted against that decision, to cut their drainage budget. It also stems to cost of growth because the city has been subsidizing drainage and our drainage fee and our drainage infrastructure for many, many years. So it's not just a problem in Sunnyside, it's a problem all over our city. It's unfunded liability. Because of the flood, and the waters came from four different areas, including overland, a rise in, rise in the water table, and, uh, and also the gates, we have committed to automating those gates. But there are, what we need to do is we need to look at mitigation and flood protection for all of our city. Thank, Thank you very you. much. All right, I know we've still got a couple chips floating around out there and Mr. Alexander looks like he'd like to cash his in. So you have one minute, sir. The issue, whether it's flood mitigation or other underlying infrastructure issues is that we are not prioritizing as we need to. There's far too much concern for baubles or otherwise frivolous spending and not for basic infrastructure that allows us to really enjoy our standard of living on a day in day out, day out, day in, day out basis. Whether it's the stormwater that should have been addressed after the last flood, 
We have to realize the last flood was only a 20-year event. This one was only a 50-year event. We have to plan for a 100-year event, and there is no excuse for not jumping up and down and insisting on it until we move forward. I don't care what the rest of the council has decided. We must represent the interests of our ward first and not stop until it's taken care of. And let's face it, there are other wards in the same situation. So we can build alliances on this issue, and we must. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Would anybody like to add anything? There's one ship left out there? No? All right. That wraps up the questions this evening, but we're not done just yet. I'd like to provide each of our candidates one minute to close out the evening. We'll do this in the opposite order. We did the introductions, so we will go from your right to your left. Starting with Ms. Joylyn Nodwell, you have one minute. Well, thank you very much for coming out on this Tuesday evening. It's not easy to sit here and listen to all the candidates talk, but I'd like to quickly <laughs> wrap up by saying that I stand for transparency, open government, better communication with what the residents hear uh, from city, from through the media and what actually happens, so better disclosure. I stand for fiscal responsibility. Do we want our taxes to continue to rise at the rate of 30% in the last three years, the highest in Calgary's history? Number three, at my third end of my platform, I equal representation of all the neighborhoods in Ward 7. Um, I find, I hear from lots of residents that they don't feel they have a voice on council. Um, they feel, they feel that there is a discrepancy in what, uh, in other words, um, receive attention and what, uh, and how they feel that they are neglected. And so I'd like to uh, change that by making everyone feel fair in their neighborhood by doing my best to uh, attend all, mostly most meetings and meet with as many residents as possible and get to know them at the ground level. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Nodwell. Uh, second to speak and wrap up, Mr. Brent Alexander. Sir, you have one minute. Thanks, everyone, for coming and in, in taking part in this. I support sustainable development and growth for our city through due process, and I defend the right of Ward 7 residents to be heard at that process, focus on open and accessible engagement and collaborative decision-making. I have defined proven options to deal with election funding reform through my platform and help eliminate perceived influence peddling between inner city and suburban developers with members of council. I, can, I came forward to serve, not at the feet of any master, but as an independent voice for my Ward 7 constituents and to be responsible in decision making on issues that affect all Calgarians. It is time for a positive change. I am Brent Alexander. I will be your independent voice on council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. Next to speak will be Ms. Drew Farrell. Ms. Farrell, you have one minute. Only 100 days ago, we experienced the most expensive natural disaster in Canadian history. People lost their homes, bridges and roads were destroyed, and the city of Calgary and Calgarians responded in an unprecedented way. That response did not happen by accident. It was years of preparation. The construction of the Emergency Operations Centre in Ward 7 was a smart and strategic use of tax dollars that paid off in spades. Council continues to be the place where important decisions are made. We're making long-term decisions to make Calgary a place we all want to call home. I fight far, hard for the residents of Ward 7. My motion brought in beat cops, and they made our streets safer. Crime is down 35% in six years. I was the driving force behind reducing developer subsidies by half in 2010. And I brought forward curbside recycling. We're building a great city. We have more work to do. Let's work together to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farrell. And wrapping up this evening, uh, Mr. Kevin Taylor, you have one minute, sir. It has been over 146 days since I announced my candidacy to run as Ward 7's city councillor. I've learned a few things in the last five months of door knocking on over 10,000 doors, talking to families, seniors, and business owners. Above all, Calgarians are telling me that they are ready for a change. Calgarians have told me that we must prioritize our spending. 
to lessen the negative impact on taxpayers. My platform is about mobility, accountability, affordability. We need strong leadership in Ward 7, someone who is going to respond and be responsive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor, and thank you very much to all of the candidates and all the best on Election Day. A big thank you to Civic Camp and the citizens who provided the questions tonight. I'd also like to thank all of our sponsors, CBC Calgary, CGSW, Fast Forward Weekly, Metro Calgary, LivestreamCalgary.com, Calgary Sound Rentals, Calgary Roadrunners, Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils, the Alberta Teachers Association, the University of Calgary Students' Union, the Students' Association of Mount Royal University, the Calgary Foundation, and our host tonight, Eau Claire Market, for their generous donations. Again, thank you all for coming out tonight to learn a little bit more about your candidates. Remember, Civic Camp is also hosting other trustee, mayoral, and council forums that you're eligible to vote for, so please visit civiccamp.org. For dates and details, good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. <laughs>